I'm going to begin by continuing some of the lecture from today because we have things that we need to know before we do them in lab. So come to Papa. There we go. We ended up here with the how much mirror the man needs to see his entire body. We learned about the image. How far away from the mirror is the image? As far as he is from the same distance he is. So we call the distance he is the distance object. And we call the distance to the image the distance image. And distance image equals distance object for a plane mirror. Notice the spelling of the word plane. It doesn't mean unadorned, it means flat. For a flat mirror, the image is the same distance behind the mirror as the object is in front. In fact, technically, we put a minus sign here. We say it's a negative image distance because it's behind the mirror. Now, what defined that this was the image? There's, it's kind of nebulous often, we just don't talk about it, but there's a very important reason that's the image. I talked briefly about it in class today. We'll ask Joseph. Hello. Joseph, what defines where the image is located? Go ahead and grab your book. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah, this is not yours. What defines where the image is located? Where his head is. Not where his head is. That's where the object is located. It's important to keep those two things in your mind, the object and the image. The object is the thing you're looking at. The image is the thing you see. So what? It's not where the mirror is placed. It's where the rays that you see, right? He's looking, he sees this ray coming from his foot. If, his, if he took another ray that came from another, you know, from the foot that was just a little bit apart so that they both came into the eye, they would converge back to meeting here. It's where the rays that your eye sees go back and extrapolate to where they came from. They didn't have to really have something there. But it's where your eye extrapolates the rays back to where they started. If the rays really are where they, your eye extrapolates them, then it's a real image. If the rays are not really there, then it's a virtual image. So if you look at that picture, is when he looks at his feet, is he really seeing light that's passing through where the image of his feet are? No. The dashed the dash lines are there to indicate there's no real light going here. That's just where his brain extrapolates that it came from. And so this is a virtual image because the rays didn't really meet there. So just another example with the actual words. Notice here I wrote distance image equals distance object, but in reality there should be that minus sign here because the distance image is negative because of the side of the mirror it's on. Now, for our experiment today, you're also just going to measure the magnitude, how big the number is, and not worry about the sign. So what we're going to do is, in line with that, magnification. Magnification is defined as the height of the image divided by the height of the object. And it turns out, doing geometry, that's equal to minus the distance of the image over the distance of the object. So if distance image is minus distance object, then I just put minus parenthesis minus distance object, right? Substitute for distance image minus distance object. And I get 1. So the magnification here should be 1. From a plain mirror, the magnification is always 1. Only from a plain mirror. If it's a curved mirror, it's not the same. In fact, I'll bring out curved mirrors while you guys are doing your experiments so you can have fun looking at them and see. Notice the image is upright. That is, the flame is on the top, both on the candle and on the image of the candle. You can also have an inverted image. And we're going to look at inverted images in lab today. 
Okay, moving forward here. We're not going to do the clickers here. Don't worry about pulling them out. But if I have a person here, which object or objects can that person see? What do you think? Somebody shot one out if they think they see one. Okay, B. So let's see if he can see B. So light from B. would all be able to hit that mirror, right? And how does it reflect? Okay, the angle of incidence is angle refraction, what, what I heard um, Andrew say. So for the reflected light, you can have here, something should be about the same angle, so something like, Looks about like that. And for here, about the same angle. So it looks something like, I don't know, that. So he would be able to see light from something like that would come right to it. And so you're right. B, he can see. What about A or C? For A, using the same thing, light from A could go like this, like that. That's as far over as it can go or it's going to be blocked by the wall. The reflection coming back here is going to go like something like that. Well, he ain't going to see that. That's not going to hit him. And so he would only be able to see A if he was somewhere in that ballpark. And finally, object C, <laughs> oh, I forgot to put lines. I get sloppy when I think I'm using the line tool. Object C is going to hit at angles like that. Well, how's that going to reflect? Yeah, it's it's going to come out something like this. So he would have to be in this range to be able to see object C. Right? That's just applying our rules of reflections there to make sure we understand how they work. This here, I will pick up next class period. Um, have you noticed that when you look at something in water, like you look at a person standing in water, there are, let's say, waist and up is out of water and waist below is in the water? It looks like their legs are like shifted at a funny angle and short. That's because light goes slower in the water. And because it goes slower, it makes things look like they're closer. And so we're going to get into that stuff with this. I'm going to skip over this and go to today's lab. We will talk about lenses, which require refraction. But I don't want to go through the whole unit on refraction and then end up staying here, you know, too late. So shifting over to the actual laboratory experiment. Presentation stopped. Presentation started. Okay, we're doing the optics lab. Now we're going to be dealing first with a plane mirror, exactly what I've been working with, and then with lenses. So let's look at the plane mirror part of the experiment and then come back and talk about lenses. So looking at the plane mirror part of the experiment, you're going to be doing this here. Now I'm going to show you the pieces that you're going to use. You're going to grab yourself a piece of cardboard and underneath the cardboard, a piece of styrofoam with a little cutout piece a little flat mirror, and five equal length push pins. Make sure they're all the same length before you go. So that's all you need. Now, oh, and I'll have to get you some paper. Take your paper, and I have here one that I had already been working with. Take your paper, put it on the cardboard. This is just to hold the mirror. Place the mirror in the center of the cardboard. 
Make sure it's not near the edge of the paper, but at the center. As soon as you have it placed there, take your pen or pencil, and holding the mirror in place, mark where the back surface of the mirror is. The reason for that is very, very simple. There's a really good chance you're going to bump the mirror and move it. You want to be able to move it back to where it was. The reason we mark the back surface, and I'm actually going to slide this back a little to make sure that it's right on the pin line, is because that's where it's reflecting light from. So I'm marking where the reflective surface is. Then I take my push pins, and one pin, I pick it up. This is going to be my object. So you're going to do two trials. Each person is going to do two trials. So you have a group of two people. That means that Michaela does two trials and Daisy does two trials. One trial is going to be with the push pin about one inch from the back of the paper. So I just push it in, put it straight down, make sure it's vertical. Once you get it in place, take your pen or pencil and put a circle around it just so you'll be able to find where it was when you take everything out. If you only had one hole, you might find it quickly. But if you have multiple places where you put holes in, it's harder. So I put circles around so I know exactly where they are. And then I'm going to put an O there to label it as the object. And you can see up there I wrote the word object. O is fine. Then I'm going to take two additional push pins that I'm going to use for sighting. So I just have two push pins. And these push pins are also going to be about an inch from the edge of the paper, but off to each side. Notice I am not carefully determining where they are. Just about an inch in, put them in. Once again, circle them each. And I label one pin one and one pin two. Now comes the actual part where you have to be careful. I'm going to take a pin, and I'm going to place the pin so that it is between pin one and the object and in line. So I come down here, I have to get down low, and I line it up so when I look at this black pin, I have black and black, that's a bad idea. Make sure that you have different colors for the pins back here. Right, so your object pin should not be the same color as one of the other pins. Kind of makes life difficult. I line them up so I'm looking right from one to the next. And then I place this pin in between them. And so now I have a black pin, then I see the white pin, then the mirror, then it reflects black on the white pin, and I see it all as a straight line. Now I place this one pin, again I put a circle around it, and mark it as X. Now I'm going to come up here and illustrate where not to put it. Don't put it here. If you put it there, it will also be on the line and block, but we want it to be between the mirror and pin one, not between the mirror and the object. Does everybody understand the difference there? Because it's really easy to make that mistake. I did not give Toussaint the careful instruction on this, and so he placed it here. It's lined up just great. It's just on the wrong side. Okay. You do that again with the other pin, and once you have all those pins placed, all of them circled and labeled, then you take it all apart. Now, of course, I don't have them all circled and labeled because I stopped short. Now you grab yourself a ruler, and using that ruler, you draw a straight line that goes from pin 1 to pin X and keeps going all the way to the end of the paper. Likewise, draw a straight line that goes from pin 2 to pin Y and all the way on to the rest of the paper. So what I'm saying is you're going to draw I went off the screen. It picks up your right pin when I do that. I'm going to draw that and draw that. Those are what my eye sees. Right? Because my eye is just extrapolating back. 
And so my eye sees the image as the place where those two meet. So that's why I marked it as the image. You're going to mark where they meet the image. Now notice there are two additional rays here going from the reflective surface of the mirror to my object for each one of these. So now I can actually mark what was going on with light. Light was starting at my object and going out like this, reflecting and coming back like this. And then my brain was seeing that light extrapolated back for the image. Now we're going to measure the object and image distances. So I recommend that you go ahead and use your ruler again and just draw a straight line that goes from object to image. By geometrical definitions, that line should be perpendicular to the mirror. And then you simply measure this distance here is the distance object. This distance here is the distance image. So you measure those. So Michaela's done this. She's done one. How many does she have to do? Two. Two. The second one is going to be just like the first one, except instead of placing the pin about one centimeter from the edge of the paper, get a new piece of paper and place it about, and I have one centimeter, one inch. Place it about two inches from the mirror. So you're moving it in. So you're going to do the same thing a second time, just with a different object position. So each one of you does two. Any questions about how this works? Okay, now the more important question. Any idea why you're doing this? Okay, that is one of the important outcomes. That we see the distance image should be about the same as the distance object. You have a question that asks you about that to see if you learn that. Another important thing we're shooting, thank you, Denver, for answering. Another important thing we're shooting at is for you to understand what makes the image formation. How do we define that's where the image is? Now, another question you have to ask yourself is was that a real image or a virtual image? Virtual. Why did you say virtual? Okay, because it's behind the mirror and the light didn't actually go behind the mirror. So the light rays weren't really there. Now let me illustrate the difference between a virtual and a real image with actual light. Since we're studying light, it's kind of useful to see actual light. So here's some actual light. And I have the light hitting, this is a plain mirror. Plain mirror meaning it's flat. And so the light hits that mirror. The, these parallel rays never meet, right? Never meet. So where's my image if they never meet? How far away do you go? Infinity. My image is at infinity because they never meet. But let's go to this one. Here I have parallel rays that came in. They hit the curved surface and reflected back. But because the surface was curved, they all meet somewhere. Do I form an image? Yes, I do. And where is that image? Okay, it's in front of the mirror. We define it as the place where they meet. Now, there's a special name for the image formed by parallel rays. The image formed by parallel rays we call the focal point. So this is the focal point. Is this a real image or a virtual image? Real. real. Why do you say real? Because the rays actually meet there. If I put my finger here, I see the light on my finger. It's a real image. If we take this projector, it's projecting light and making an image. Is it a real image or a virtual image that you see at the projector? It's a real because we see it on the screen. They really meet on the screen. If it was virtual, the only way I'd be able to see it would be to look into the lens. Like that would, if, if, all, if the only way I see is looking into the lens, then it's going to be a virtual one. So this is an example of making a real image if it's a concave mirror. Now, what if I go to a convex mirror? Do these rays meet? 
They don't, but their extrapolations meet back here. So this still has a focal point, but it's on the other side. Is this making a real or a virtual image? A virtual, because they don't. Okay, sounds like people got the idea there. Let's change from... Don't break it. Yeah. I don't think I've damaged it too much. All right, let's go to some lenses. Because we're going to next work with lenses. So... Lenses require us to start with refraction. Refraction is bending of light when it goes from one material to another. So, I've got lots of little fun things to throw up here. You see when light goes into this block, it bent. It changed direction. That's what refraction is. And we'll learn more about refraction in class on Wednesday. That will be the last thing we learn about is refraction in lenses. But it bends when it goes in. Now you see some other things like the light bent here hit this surface. Instead of coming out, what did it do with this surface? It reflected and then it came out here. Pretty interesting things for us to learn about. If I take a prism here, I can, well, let's do like that, that's kind of cool, but usually we do something like this. Light comes in, it bends at the front surface, bends at the back surface. These rays are all parallel still because the amount of bending was the same on each surface. But you might notice that the rays are closer together over here than they were over there because of changing the direction. Well, a lens is made by instead of having straight sides, having curved sides. So here I have curved sides. On the top, it's like my prism was, so it bent the light down. On the bottom, it's just the opposite, and it bends the light up. Parallel rays, do these rays make an image? Yes, but not a perfect one, is it? It's not perfect. There are two reasons for that. Number one is these are circular, um, surfaces, that's truly not the correct shape. Number two is these, this is not a high quality lens to begin with. But the rays essentially all meet here. So what do we call the place where parallel rays coming in meet? Focal point. So we have a focal point. Makes an image here. Is this a real or virtual image? Real. It's real because the rays really meet here. I put my finger and it shines right on my finger. So this here, we call it a converging lens. That's the kind of lens we're going to work with today. Converging lenses make real images. We can also make a lens that's just the opposite. Actually, let me get these pieces out, too, because they're kind of fun. I can make one like this. Instead of converging, making the light come together, what does this do? It spreads it. We say it diverges the light. If we look at these rays, do they meet? Yes. Yes. Where do they meet? Uh, back. back. It's the extrapolations of these. They're not going to meet on the side the light is traveling, but they extrapolate back to meeting somewhere around here. So that makes an image. It has a focal length, but is this a real or virtual image? Virtual, because the rays didn't actually meet here, is the extrapolations that met. So we can make images with lenses or with mirrors. Now this here is just kind of fun. I have a shape that is convex, thicker in the center, but it's air in the middle. That convex shape is actually diverging because it's air in the middle. And I could go just the opposite. I can make a concave shape with air in the middle, and that converges. And you notice that converges much better. It converges much better because of the shapes of these surfaces having the straight lines. Um, so that's our practical showing of what's going on with lenses of how they work.
So <clears throat> we use the basic principles of the focal point to make graphical constructions of where the image should be. And from that, we then use geometry to come up with an equation. So I'm showing the graphical construction in your book, the, the equation you get from geometry is first. But the graphical construction is where that comes from. So we have a basic, well, two basic rules. Parallel rays always meet at a single point, and what do we call that? Focal point. So if I have a parallel ray that goes from the tip of my object, it should, when it hits the, the mirror, no, it is a lens. I said it right the first time. When it hits the lens, it should refract, that's the bending, and go through the focal point on the other side. The second thing is that light works the same way forward and backward. So that means that if I had a parallel ray coming in from the opposite side, that it would refract and come through the focal point on the same side as my object. Since it works the same forward and backward, I take the ray that goes from the tip of my object through the focal point on the near side, and it comes out parallel. So you can see the focal ray and the parallel ray are just the opposites of each other. Parallel through focal point, parallel through focal point. The third ray is called the vertex ray, and it's a straight line that goes from the tip of my object through the center of the lens, and then just keeps on going. To find where an image is going to be graphically, we take our object and we draw those rays. So I have the descriptions here, the parallel ray, the vertex ray, and the focal ray. You're going to need to draw that. On the last page, last page, next last page of the lab, you have an object that's placed one and a half focal lengths from the lens, and you need to replicate this to find where the image is going to be formed. Now using geometry, trigonometry, we can take this to find an equation that relates the focal length of the lens to the distance of the object, which is the distance from the object to the center of the lens, and the distance image, the distance from the center of the lens to the image. So we can relate those mathematically. I don't think you actually use this equation, but it's good to know. It's good to know that you have the simple math relationship, so if you know what the focal length is and what the distance of the object is, you should be able to find the distance of the image. What we're actually doing for lab is going to be more exploring just looking at the light and not doing the calculations. So for the actual lab, you're going to grab a lens. Whoops, this is the first part that we already went over. You're going to grab a lens and go outside. So let's do this as a group. Everybody grab the meter stick closest to them. Um, I have two up here because I grabbed a couple. So and you only need one per group. Bring your books and something to write with. Come on up here and grab one of these five lenses that I have set out. One per group. doesn't have one yet. There's still one remaining. Oh, no. That, those actually are uh, they're, they're not meter sticks. They're ones that have things wrong with them. Like <laughs> logarithmic scales or things like that. So, grab, it's, it's the, no, the aluminum thing there. There you go. Okay. Let's go outside and bring my tablet with me. Come on out. Thing simply won't stay. Oh, the light. We're going out into the bright sunlight. This way. Oh, the light. We missed you in class, Chad.
Okay, I missed him. It is bright. Okay, so let's separate. Get a couple meters away from each group. So you got the two of you and your group separate a little bit from everyone else. You'll you'll live. Are you trying to do like burn ants? Okay, so what you want to do, and I'll come out here with with Tyler. Since he's blinded by the light. I like that reference. <laughs> you actually got it? Yes. <laughs> okay, take your meter stick and put it so the side that says zero is on the ground. Then take your meter stick and tilt it so that it makes no shadow. And then take your lens and hold it on the side of the meter stick. So, go ahead. Um, actually, bring around to the other side. It's on this side. Oh. Yes, like on yeah. the side side? And don't block the light with your hand. <laughs> okay, everybody see what Tyler's doing here? And then he's going to slide it down until he sees a bright white spot right beside the meter stick. Keep going down. It's between 20 and 10. There. Keep going. You want to get a oh, tiny, so tiny bright spot. When you get that tiny, tiny bright spot, then you look at your meter stick and say, how far from the bottom of the meter stick is the lens? Like 18. Okay, try to get as accurate as you can. Is that about the smallest? I'm leaving it to you. Oh, there you go. That appears to be 19. I can't tell because the block. I know, it's hard. That's why you're going to have a big uncertainty. So you got your best measurement? Yeah. Okay. So now you write that. You didn't bring your book. So now you write that down in your book. So what did you say? I'll write down yours. Uh, 18 to 19. Okay, so 18 point what? 18.5 plus or minus. <laughs> okay, so I've got that recorded for you. Okay, so when we get in there, you'll have it. So everybody get your focal length here. And after you have it, make sure you mark it in your book so you don't forget it. How precise are we looking for? How precise do you think you can get? Uh, what edge are you like having? Well, to I, I'm doing it like this, and then make it so the meter stick has no shadow. Yeah. And then slide it down and try to read where. I mean, where, where are we measuring from? On that? You're, well, you're measuring from the bottom up to where the lens was. Oh, from the actual. From the actual position of the lens, yeah. Okay, so I, it looked like. Are you Yeah, that's too close. Move back a little. There, too bad, too far now. Right, you want the smallest size it gets about there, yeah. And so then you say, so where is that on the meter stick? I guess that's the one that I was using earlier today because that's where I found it. Don't kill animals. Okay, wood you can burn all you want. On the other hand, don't burn your lab books, just because sometimes students decide to do that. Look at that. No, Colby was being funny. You can smell it. Yeah. Oh, it smells like barbecue. It started. <laughs> okay, so everybody have their focal lengths? Okay, let's head back in. <laughs> if you want to do fun things, we can bring out my big mirror. It collects a lot of light. <laughs> when I was at PUC, I was trying to measure focal lengths, and I had something that was like a foot in diameter, and I accidentally hit my foot with it. Ooh, talk about pain. <laughs> that was a whole lot of heat. <laughs> Yeah.
guys in the woods. Yeah, well, I, I had a student who took my mirror and caught a tree on fire with it. <laughs> he was just having a field day. No, keep it. You're using it. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you put the stuff away. Oh, I think those are going to use it. Oh, are we supposed to keep those? Yes, you're supposed to keep them. <laughs> oh, Tyler, can you handle the big one? Yeah, make sure you get back the same one. Okay, now that you have done that, apparently I lost my connection while I was outside, which makes sense actually, I was outside a Wi-Fi range. Okay, so now that we've done that, we're ready to work on this table. So there are two parts of the lab. For this one, you need to, just from the blue box, grab one of these rails and this box for light. You plug the power supply in, and of course, into power, and turn it on and light. Voila! What you're going to do now is you're going to take your lens and first place the lens a distance less than the focal length you just determined. Now, yours has this mask off. Take the mask off. Put it in here. And you want to put this mask on, the one that says cross arrow target. Just stick it to the front with the magnets. So I put that on here. And now I'm going to take this and place it less than one focal length. So in your case, you measured focal length to be 18 and a half plus or minus 0.5 centimeters. So I'm going to put it less than 18 and a half centimeters away. Choose a number between 0 and 18 and a half. I'm going to choose 10, right? Reasonable. So I'm just going to place this 10 centimeters. I have my filter right at 16, so I'm going to go out to 26. And now this holds it eh, reasonably OK. So I'm going to put that at 26 here. I don't have to be exact. And now I'm going to find where the image is formed. Where, how do you find where the image is formed? So I got a piece of paper here. I go, didn't find it. If I don't find it, then I look in. So Denver, look through it. What do you see? He sees bright light. He's still doing better than Sergeant Schultz, who would have seen nothing. <laughs> Somebody recognizes the reference. So what do you see, Denver? <laughs> what you're seeing is reflection. Don't pay attention to that. <laughs> I see, um, is it bigger or smaller? It's bigger. Okay, so I'm going to write here, bigger for the size. What about the orientation? Is it upright or inverted? Upright or upside down? Upright. Okay, so upright. He's comparing with the actual slide to what he sees when he looks through the lens. Real or virtual? If it's real... How would you know it's real? You'd see it on the paper. We didn't see it on the paper, so that means it must be virtual. If you have that case, just put a cross through the image position because you can't find the position. Now, the next one says between F and 2F. So once again, in this case, my focal length is 18 and a half. So that means 2F is, what, 37? So between 18 and a half and 37 away. Hmm. I'm going to go for 25 away. 16 and 25 is about 41. So I'm going to just place this at 41. Start at the beginning again. Where's the image? How do I find it? 
Paper. Paper. Put the paper here, bring it back, and there it is. So now, can you hold that Denver? So now Denver's holding that, and I'm going to have his partner tell me what he sees. First of all, is the distance from the lens to the image, the image distance, is it less than F, between F and 2F, is it at 2F, or is it greater than 2F? Okay, so I'm going to go with what he said, greater than 2F. Okay, now looking at the image that you see where Denver's holding it, is that image bigger or smaller than the object? Is it upright or inverted? Is it virtual or real? How'd you know that? Because it's on the paper. Okay, notice this column here, the image position column uses the same options as the object position column did. So you don't measure the actual distance, you just say, is it less than F between F and 2F or, greater than, or equal to 2F or greater than 2F? Those are the only options for the image position. I am not going to go through the next two because I don't think anyone's made any mistakes yet. I don't want to do everything for you. So for the last one, now we're going to be specific at one and a half F. So with Tyler's lens, what would one and a half F be? Okay, 18 plus 9 is 27, and I have a half plus a quarter, 27 and 3 quarters. So I need to place it exactly 27 and 3 quarters from where I have this mask. So 16 plus 27 and 3 quarters is going to be 43 and 3 quarters. So I put it right here, 43 and 3 quarters, and now you're going to have to have a meter stick and measure the actual distance in centimeters to where the image is formed. So this is the only one where you're actually getting a numerical value. So you're going to get that distance and then take that distance. So I'm going to write it down on, hey Denford, you found it. We're going to do a real quick and dirty. So this will probably not be accurate, which is good because I don't want to give you everything away. So that's about 44 centimeters. Notice I said real quick and dirty. I didn't measure carefully. I should have had one more significant digit. So don't do it. So 44 centimeters, in terms of my focal length, I just take 44 divided by 18 and a half, and that would tell me how many focal lengths it is. So get that in terms of focal lengths. You know, that's somewhere in the ballpark of, you know, two point something focal lengths. Two focal lengths would have been 36. You know, get it in terms of focal lengths. Everybody understand how to get in terms of focal lengths? I don't want anyone to be like, I didn't understand. Okay, then for its size, actually measure the size of the circles. If you look at your object, the object has circles, well, a single circle, and that circle is one centimeter in diameter. Measure the actual size of that, and then figure out, you know, the size instead of one centimeter, it's, you know, let's say 1.3 centimeters. I'm just making it up now. And then the orientation, if it's upright or inverted, if it's real or virtual. Here's where you do your ray diagram. You've got the example, you've got the descriptions, but you need to do the ray diagram and find where the image is. And then you have to answer questions comparing that last measurement where we had careful numbers recorded to the drawing that you made. So any questions about the process here? All right then, how about it?